All right, guys. So this is my presentation on Usher syndrome and Nori disease, and we're going to start off by talking about Usher syndrome first. Okay. So, what is it, Usher syndrome? So Usher syndrome is a condition characterized by bilateral, partial, or total hearing loss and vision that worsens over time and sometimes affects the balance system. The hearing loss in the Usher syndrome is classified as sensory neural and vision loss is caused by an eye disease associated with Usher syndrome called retinitis pigmentosa um, that targets light sensing cells of the retina, specifically the rods and the cones. Now, there are three different subtypes of Usher syndrome, um, type one, two, and three. Uh, type one and two are the most common and they comprise about 95% of Usher syndrome cases uh, in the United States and 5% of cases are due to type 3. <clears throat> and type 3, again, is extremely rare. All right, etiology. So Usher syndrome is a result of a genetic mutation that can occur in several different genes. It is inherit inherited as an autosomal recessive disorder autosomal meaning that the mutated gene is not on either chromosome so that both men and women are equally likely to have the disorder as well as pass it on and recessive meaning that the condition occurs when a child inherits two copies of the same mutated gene um, so one from each parent the genes affected will determine what type of usher syndrome an individual will have um, genes associated with type 1 include MYO7A, USH1C, CDH23, PCDH15, and SANS. Um, so there's five for type 1. There's three for type 2, which are USH2A, VLGR1, WHRN, <coughs> excuse me, and then um, one for type 3, um, USH3A sub S. All right, pathogenesis. So the genes affected in those with Usher syndrome are responsible for creating proteins involved in normal hearing, balance, and vision. The proteins affected uh, determines which structures of the inner ear and eye are also affected. Um, generally, the proteins, excuse me, um, the proteins affected by Usher syndrome are localized to the hair cell bundle and synapses of the hair cells. Um, the proteins affected are also a part of a group of proteins called a protein complex. Um, and they have roles in both the inner inner ear and retina, um, whose exact functions are not well known. Um, so basically, um, the protein complex just means that they are involved in um, different areas of the body, um, and in this case, the inner ear and the retina of the eye. So for the pathogenesis of type one, again, um, there were five genes associated with that. Uh, mutations in these four here um, results in fragmented hair cell bundles um, likely or which is thought to, to be due to a disconnection between kinocilium and their neighboring stereocilia as well as uh, just between the stereocilia themselves again well not again but this morphological defect in the hair cells is what's going to affect the transduction um, necessary for hearing and it's ultimately going to result in the hearing loss for these patients. Um, so mutations in these four also affect the retina um, and they do so by increasing the threshold of the transduction of light. So that's um, what's responsible for their vision problems. Um, and then SANS is the gene um, and if that's affected it's going to result in defects in the upper tip links on top of the stereocilia. So they are either defective or they're absent. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, moving on to type 2, um, the three genes associated with that, US2A um, mutations there or in this gene is, is believed to affect the stria vascularis. Um, the exact place is unknown. Um, VLGR1 and 
its mutation there affects ankle links at the stereocilia base, um, resulting in disorganized hair cell bundles, again affecting the transduction mechanism there. And WHRN um, affects the photoreceptors of the retina and causes shortened stereocilia as well as disorganized outer hair cell bundles. So uh, mutations there not only affect vision, but also hearing. Again, similarly in the same way, um, affecting the the transduction process <clears throat> due to the uh, short stereocilia and the disorganized um, hair cell bundles there. And then type 3, um, the mutations in H3A are going to result in a similar morphological defects of outer hair cell bundles and um, reduce transduction and sensitivity of vestibular hair cells. Um, so just kind of diving into a little bit more detailed information um, regarding the patient themselves. Um, those with type 1, <coughs> uh, most individuals uh, born with type 1 present with congenital, bilateral, profound sensory neural hearing loss with no vestibular function. Um, the absence of the vestibular function results in vestibular areflexia, which is characterized by an absence of caloric nystagmus during a VNG. So if you're able to do a caloric on these patients, um, nothing's going to happen. They're going to get no eye movement or no nystagmus uh, measured there due to the um, absence of the vestibular function. Uh, these individuals also have progressive vision loss um, initially re um, resulting in decreased night vision before the age of 10 and then rapidly progressing until the person is completely blind. And because of the balance problems associated at birth, um, children with type 1 display significant delays in being able to sit up without support and are rarely ever begin um, or able to walk before 18 months old. Um, so delayed uh, motor motor skills there. Um, I think the normal age is about 12 months. I may be mistaken, but so six months after that is when they usually start. Um, well, not usually, but they rarely. Well, yeah, I guess they usually start uh, to walk around 18 months. All right, so type two. Uh, children with type two of Usher syndrome present with moderate to severe bilateral sensory hurt. Um, sensory neural hearing loss at birth uh, with normal vestibular function and balance abilities. Uh, the hearing loss begins as high frequency hearing loss having a prelingual onset. So um, compared to type 1 <clears throat> which has a profound hearing loss, um, type 2 is not as bad. Um, however, it is it is still bad, moderate to severe. Um, but they actually have uh, normal vestibular function and balance abilities. Um, moving on, so those with type 2 also experience vision issues, but they may not occur until second decade of life, so 20 years or so. Um, similarly to type 1, vision loss begins with decreased night vision, progressing to severe vision loss by their midlife. And then lastly, type 3. Uh, those with type 3, um, this one's actually pretty variable in their symptoms. Um, they have normal hearing, balance, and vision at birth. The hearing loss tends to get worse over time, but again, that variability, the rate and severity um, varies from person to person. Um, severity ranges from moderate to profound. Um, generally, loss begins during childhood or early teens. Uh, similarly, vision loss also varies in severity and age of onset. Generally, vision problems begin with night night vision issues during teen years, which progresses to severe loss by the midlife. Um, vestibular function is normal at birth, but they may develop issues later on in life. Again, highly variable with type 3. Uh, epidemiology. Uh, Usher syndrome is a rare genetic condition affecting about 1 in 6,000 births, so it's extremely rare right off the bat. Uh, it is the leading cause of deaf blindness. Uh, the most common types of Usher syndrome, which I touched on earlier, are types 1 and 2, accounting for 90 to 95% of all the cases 
Um, type 3, extremely rare in the United States, about 5%. Risk factors. So the only known risk factor of Usher syndrome is having parents who have the disorder and or parents who carry the genes for the disorder. So if they have the disorder, um, you'll know right off the bat um, because hopefully they'll report that to you. And um, if for some reason they don't exhibit or they have, they may, if they're just carriers for it, I mean, um, and they decided to do genetic testing for some reason, they found out they had um, the genes for the disorder, then that would be a risk factor as well, just having that knowledge. Um, but other than that, that would be it. Um, so let's talk about the clinical and differential diagnosis. So it's actually pretty hard to do because Usher syndrome, or with Usher syndrome, there are no visually obvious signs. Um, just looking at, just looking at them, you can't tell. Um, however, there are some red flags to look out for, I mean, which include congenital or early onset of hearing loss, uh, balance problems, and later onset vision, about uh, vision problems as well. Audiological and vestibular testing is useful, though, to determine the severity of the hearing loss, and it also helps to identify which type of Usher syndrome a child has, uh, mainly because um, each type, like I said, has a different severity range of hearing loss, and the vestibular function um, is also um, compromised in some some of the types, while in, in, in another it's normal, specifically type 2, it's normal. Um, <clears throat> But the diagnosis of Usher syndrome is only accomplished with an interdisciplinary approach that involves us, the audiologists, uh, primary care, pediatrician, ophthalmologist, optometrist, and the medical geneticist. Um, again, our role as the audiologist is just determine, or not to just, but to determine the hearing loss severity. Excuse me. And depending on what you get from that, that'll um, narrow down which type they have, um, primary care is involved, the ophthalmologist and optometrist is involved because, um, again, vision is compromised in these patients, so they do certain tests um, to see, or yeah, they do certain tests to diagnose issues of the retina, um, as well as to measure visual capabilities and um, I guess prescribe glasses and then the medical geneticist is involved in just doing the gene testing so you can figure out which genes are affected and if you know the genes that are infect or that are affected then you can determine the type all right <clears throat> so um, here's just some case history or things to think about during when you're taking a case history um, to look out for and to think about. So first thing being hearing loss. Um, the biggest thing there is it's going to be congenital hearing loss. It's going to, or it could be progressive occurring during the childhood or early teens. Um, typically they're going to be, depending on the type, failed newborn hearing screening, especially in type 1 where there's a profound loss and type 2 which has the moderate to severe. Um, these patients are likely not to respond to sounds, again, just depending on the type and severity and the progression. Um, they may have late milestones, again, bringing it back to walking after 18 months. Um, similarly, the balance issues, the trouble sitting up, standing, and that's something to look out for. Um, vision, again, because that's one of the primary senses affected um, the decreased ability with night vision or ability to see in general most always by the age of 10 but again also varies between types but that's something if they have the vision issues if they have the hearing loss and balance then it's likely well it just helps you narrow down to possibilities of what the syndrome is um, being usher syndrome in this case and then lastly, the dead giveaway during a case history is if patients know they are already carriers of the gene, then you're pretty much done there. 
Okay. And then this is just a little table um, summarizing all the things that I talked about. Um, just kind of a quick glance, quick guide, I guess, if you want to think of it that way. <clears throat> but so for type one, again, hearing is going to be profound hearing loss or deafness at birth. Um, the vision in these patients are going to be decreased night vision by age of 10, progressing to severe vision loss by midlife. Um, they're going to have no vestibular function at birth in type 1 or with type 1, and that'll be characterized by that absent caloric response or the vestibular arreflexia. And then in type 2, um, the hearing is going to be moderate to severe the vision, same thing, decreased night vision, but by age of by the teen years, progressing to severe vision loss by midlife. Um, but these patients will have normal balance. Um, type 3, progressive hearing loss in childhood or early teens, variable severity. Uh, vision and um, is going to vary as well in severity and age of onset of loss. Night vision, again, is going to be the first thing to be affected. Um, but starting in the teen years and progressing to severe vision loss by midlife. Um, type 3 is also going to have either near to normal balance, near to nor uh, no I'm sorry, normal to near normal balance in childhood um, with a chance of later or problems occurring later on in life. So uh, this table kind of helps you narrow down which type of Usher syndrome that you might be dealing with. All right, so let's talk about the audiometry portion. Um, so for type 1, otoscopy is going to be normal because it's not visually obvious. Um, TIMPs are going to be type A because it's not a, con it's not a um, conductive hearing loss, so the middle ear won't be affected. Reflexes, uh, they're going to be present if sufficient or if there's sufficient res or residual hearing, um, but most likely they're going to be elevated or absent. Um, pure tones are going to be profound. SRT is going to be consistent with the pure tones. Word rec is going to be consistent with the hearing loss. OAEs are going to be absent. And the ABRs, um, if you have to go that way or use that method to test, is going to be profound as well. A type 2, again, normal. Otoscopy, um, type A temps, because the hearing loss isn't as bad as type 1, it's going to be present. Um, if there's sufficient residual hearing, again, it's going to depend on the pure tones, um, which are going to be either moderate to severe. Um, SRT, consistent with pure tones. Word Rex, consistent with the hearing loss. Absent OAEs, um, again, if if you're using an ABR to test these patients, they're going to be in the moderate to severe range as well. And then type 3, normal, same thing, normal otoscopy, type A temps, present reflexes, depending on the hearing loss. Again, it's going to vary greatly in these, in these um, patients just because it's all over the board. Um, pure tones variable. SRT is going to be consistent with the hearing loss. Word rec consistent. OEs. Could be present, could be absent, um, depending on the progression of loss. And then ABR, again, if you have to do that, it's going to be variable. <clears throat> and all right, let's talk about the vestibular testing. So something important to keep in mind is because these individuals have vision problems, um, depending where they're at, they're likely not going to be able to even perform them. Um, same with, I guess, uh, yeah, just almost the entire VNG besides calorics, um, they're really not going to be able, they might not be able to perform, sorry, if they have the profound hearing loss, you're not able to communicate them or communicate with them. Um, again, it could be you're seeing them when they're really young, so you might not be able to even do a VNG. Um, but yeah, anyways, so <clears throat> if you are able to do one with type 1, 
Um, the oculomotors motors are going to be normal, assuming that they can perform them. Um, positionals are going to would be normal. Um, calorics are going to be absent, and so remember to keep in mind that type one is always going to have the vestibular issues or absent vestibular function at birth. Sorry, so they're going to have the vestibular reflexia, which is the absence of nystagmus dur during a caloric. So you do the caloric on these people, I mean, you're not going to get any eye movement whatsoever. Um, you're also going to get a bilateral weakness, of course, because there's no stimu um, no function on either side. Then if you're able to perform the rotary chair, um, you're going to get a bilateral weakness with type 1 patients. Again, type 2, same thing. If you can perform, or if they can perform the ocular motors, um, they're going to be normal. Uh, positional testing is going to be normal. Calorics will be normal. Rotary chair will be normal. Um, and then for type 3, same thing. Normal ocular motors, assuming they can perform normal positionals. Um, variable calorics, however, because sometimes balance is affected in these patients, so it's hard to say exactly what you'll find. And then same thing, rotary chair is also going to be variable because um, you don't know if the vestibular system will be compromised as well. Okay, so <clears throat> medical evaluations and treatment. Unfortunately, um, as of today, there's no, cur cure, uh, no current cure for Usher syndrome. The best treatment options rely on early identification to allow for proper intervention techniques for speech and language development. Um, because of those, <clears throat> um, because people with Usher, Usher syndrome also have vision problems due to retinitis pigmentosa, um, optometric evaluation is advised just to assist with their vision maybe they can get some glasses or um, something else um, testing typically includes direct examination of the retina where the examiner looks for dead retinal cells um, which are called bone spicules or um, attenuated blood vessels um, an ophthalmologist will also perform an electroretinogram or an erg um, and that'll help them diagnose the retinitis pigmentosa um, in their eyes and then the ear so just some information on the ERG the ERG is a, a evoked response much like the AVR but it is a response from the cones and the rods of the retina um, although we aren't performing this test um, just to, this might be useful or useless information to know but the ERG or I'm sorry ERG amplitude is going to be reduced or absent when retinitis pigmentosa or Usher syndrome is present. So uh, I guess just keep that in your back pocket. And then this slide, so this is a picture of a retina um, of a patient with Usher syndrome on the left and then a normal retina on the right. Um, the black arrow on the left Hopefully you can see the mouse. Um, so this black arrow here indicates a pale optic nerve. Um, the vessels indicated by these stars <clears throat> um, appear thin, especially compared to the normal one. So lack of blood blood flow there. And then the white arrows down here and up there are going to show um, dead retinal cells or the bone spicules that I um, touched on earlier. Um, so genetic testing is also rec recommended when managing Usher's syndrome, um, and since there's no cure, genetic testing simply provides parents um, with further information on the syndrome, and it's going to also help determine which type they have, um, which is huge, not only for the parents, but also for us, um, because we can, um, if we know that early on, we can kind of already form our intervention strategies on whether they're going to be CI candidates, if they have their profound congenital loss, or if they have the very loss, we can just be prepared, be prepared that hearing aids will likely be um, the next step. Um, some other things that you can do, uh, vitamin A supplements have also been recommended. Um, there's some pre preliminary evidence suggesting that it a dose or a high dose of vitamin A may slow down the pro progression of 
vision loss in retinitis pigmentosa in type 2 patients. Um, so that's just something to think about to help with the vision um, vision issues. Um, now, kind of going mo more into our area, uh, audiological treatment for Usher syndrome includes CIs, uh, traditional amplification and assistive listening devices, depending on the age and uh, needs of the child. Um, again, intervention strategy depends on the type of Usher syndrome that the child has. So type 1, uh, because those with type 1 have the congenital profound hearing loss, traditional hearing aids are usually not, or they're not sufficient, um, and cochlear implants are recommended because they have that profound loss. Um, Cochlear implants have been proven to be a successful approach for this population as they are able to hear open speech or open set speech and also develop oral communication skills. And then those with type 2 and 3, um, because those with type 2 have the moderate to severe uh, sensory neural hearing loss, they generally respond well to traditional amplification. So just a Regular old hearing aid would be fine for them. Um, similarly, those with type 3, um, because they have the variable degrees in hearing loss, they will also excuse me, they will also respond well respond well to traditional amplification. <coughs> uh, excuse me. Um, however, just something to keep in mind, hearing loss may progress over time. So these individuals in with type 2 and 3. Um, do have the potential to become CI candidates later on in life if the hearing loss does get worse. So just something to think about. Um, and that being said, audiological monitoring is important for this population. Um, but because they're pediatric patients, you'll likely be seeing them pretty often anyway. So that won't really be an issue as far as tracking goes. Um, okay, so... Let's move on to the case study. Um, I designed this case study to be just kind of a typical or general case for type 1, uh, mainly because type 1 is going to be, well, type 1 and type 2 are the, are the most common. Um, type 3, you're probably not going to see, truthfully. Um, so this case history is basically for type 1 to help you realize or, um, or to assist in your diagnosis of of this one. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so the case history. So um, we have an 8-month-old male or boy. Uh, this was an at-home birth. Uh, doesn't seem to respond to sound. Um, unable to sit up or stand on his own, doesn't make any speech sounds, no family history of hearing loss, and parents concerned for hearing. Um, so again, yeah, I made this one up. It's not an actual case study, but um, I threw a couple, couple, uh, I, not curveballs, but things to kind of throw it off. But anyways, so first things first. Um, what you're going to want to look at is the age of the patient. So the eight-month-old male, um, very young, doesn't seem to respond to sound, so the parents are aware there, there's a hearing loss. Um, and with Usher syndrome, if it's type 1, it's going to be at birth um, and a profound loss, so that's a valid assessment on the parents. Um, yeah, um, that, so that home birth, that doesn't really matter, but if they were at a hospital, then they would have been, um, they would have had the newborn hearing screening done. So they would have been identified earlier. Um, but because this was at home birth, they didn't have that done. So they're coming in now. Anyways, doesn't seem to respond to sound. That's consistent with type 1 because of that profound hearing loss. Um, unable to sit up. Or stand on his own. That's the second thing that sticks out here is that type 1 again has no vestibular function. So, oh, and they also have the um, delays in 
um, the motor skills. So unable to sit up, stand up on his own, that's a huge red flag. Red flag. Um, doesn't make any speech sounds. That makes sense because type 1, if they have profound hearing loss, they're not going to be able to hear, so they're not going to know what speech sounds sound like, so they're not going to make any. Um, no family history of hearing loss, parents concerned. Um, yeah, that's just kind of just fluff there. Anyways, moving on. So when you're doing otoscopy, um, considering the case history, you had the three things being the hearing loss. Um, not the three, I'm sorry. You had two main things. So you had the hearing loss and you had the vestibular issues. So that's something to keep in mind. So you might be thinking Usher syndrome. Um, when you do otoscopy, it's going to be normal uh, for both the ears because, again, it's not visually obvious. Um, you're gonna, and then you do some temps. So when you do your temps, type A, you're like, okay, so it's not uh, a conductive loss. So TM is moving normally, ossicles as well. Um, it doesn't seem to be an issue with the sound actually entering the inner ear. So you're thinking, okay, likely sensory neural. Now. Uh, acoustic reflexes. So you put these in, you do the reflexes, and you get absent responses for both both ears, ipsilateral and contralateral, um, already indicating a severe hearing loss. Um, again, those with the profound or type one going to have the profound loss. Um, likely not going to get any reflexes on these patients if you're able to perform it. So that's kind of using this information like, okay, where's my audio going? It's likely going to be uh, probably, yeah, thresholds are going to be really bad, probably in the profound range. So you let's say you decide to do speech audiometry. Again, this patient's eight months old, so you're not going to probably be able to do SRT. Um, yeah, you can't do SRT. Not probably, you won't be able to. So you're going to do SDT, um, assuming you can get inserts in. This is what you get. So boom, 90, 95. That's consistent with your um, your SDT. I'm, I'm sorry, not your SDT. Your let me go back. Your reflexes. So absent reflexes, SDT. Oh, um, you're like, oh my gosh, that's this is not good. Um, likely going to be a pretty severe loss, um, given those two things there. Um, then you go to OAEs. Okay, so let's see if their outer house, hair cells are compromised or if that's what's responsible or contributing to the hearing loss. So you perform OAEs and you're going to get absent right and left. Um, I know this isn't the best picture showing absent in both ears, but I couldn't find any. So boom, absent OAEs. And then let's say you were able to do VRA with this patient with the inserts and you get this audiogram. So you get the right, severe to profound. Um, I don't know why, what this frequency is supposed to be over here, 125 maybe, but whatever. So you get uh, severe to profound in the right, moderately severe uh, to profound in the left. And that's going to be consistent with your SDT, um, your absent reflexes, that's going to make sense there, and the absent OAEs. So you know that that inner ear is really compromised um, and affected. <clears throat> and then, so given all that information, um, You have the profound loss, so you can safe you can kind of narrow it down if you were thinking Usher syndrome. Okay, it's going to be type one because it's profound, um, and given that it's profound, now you want to do some vestibular testing to see if you get the vestibular or reflexia or the absent uh, caloric responses. Um, so you decide to do calorics because. Child's eight months old, it's not going to be able to do ocular motors or positional testing. It's not going to be able to 
listen to the directions. Um, so let's say you can do the calorics, and this is what you get. So yeah, this is just showing the um, absent responses in both ears. Um, you know the vestibular system's affected. You're, you're getting that vestibular aureflexia, the lack of nystagmus, um, in addition to that profound hearing loss. So you're thinking, okay, this is probably type 1 Usher syndrome. And then, just to be safe, you're going to you move on to rotary chair. Um, and you get this bilateral weakness. That is also going to be just assisting you uh, further, saying, okay, definitely, yeah, no vestibular function. That profound hearing loss, type 1 um, Usher syndrome for sure. Um, those are the references for that. So hopefully that case case study helps you out. Um, the biggest takeaway, I think, from that would just to be um, if you are thinking Usher syndrome, I know the case history is kind of hard because it's just hearing loss and the balance issues, um, but those are the big red flags to look out for. Um, and then when you do your testing for type 1, that'll help you, um, or not for type 1, I'm sorry, your testing, that'll help you narrow it down. So you get that profound loss. You can already say, we'll assume it's going to be type 1 because type 1 has the profound loss. Type 2 is the moderate to severe. So since you got the profound, you're not worried about that. Um, and then you do the vestibular testing if possible. And you get the absent reflex. That's just the that's the hallmark right there. It's just getting the absent reflex, and you know it's the type one um, from there. Or you can assume um, because type one is going to have that absent um, absent response, and type two is going to be normal. Type three is going to be variable. But again, since type one, type two are the most common, those are the ones that you're really going to be trying to um, distinguish between. Uh, anyway, I hope that was clear um, and that was helpful. Um, I can answer, hopefully, any questions you guys might have in the discussion board later on. But anyways, let's move on to Nori disease, the second one, or my second syndrome. Um, so, Nori disease is a rare genetic eye disorder that almost exclusively affects male infants at birth. Um, the disease is X-linked and inherited through a recessive pattern causing irreversible blindness. Excuse me. Uh, the disease also affects the auditory system <coughs> causing sensory neural hearing loss in about 30% of individuals. Um, so in neuron disease patients, the main thing is going to be the um, visual, visual symptoms, um, but again, hearing loss or hearing can be affected and it's in the 30 percent um so I, it's pretty it's secondary in these um in patients or in this population and then um those with neuron disease may also be accompanied by comorbid conditions including cognitive disability um and also autism so they kind of have a lot going on um etiology and pathogenesis so Nori disease is the result of genetic mutations on the NDP gene that results in defective norin. Norin is a protein that is believed to regulate the vascularization of the retina, cochlea, and other systems. Um, norin plays a key role in a process called WNT cascade, which is a sequence of steps that affects how cells and tissues develop. Uh, specifically, norin is responsible for the development and specialization of tissue and blood vessels in the retina and the inner ear. Um, defective or absent norin results in abnormal, vasculariza yeah. abnormal vascularization of the retina and a progressive loss of vessels in the stria vascularis. <clears throat> so lack of blood supply there. Um, and also lack of endolymph production. 
Um, those with neurodegenerative disease may experience retinal degeneration, retinal detachment, cataracts, uh, leukocoria, and iris um, atrophy. Um, initially, subjects with neurodegenerative disease present with complete retinal detachment and blindness at birth, although it can occur several months after birth. Um, detachment occurs when the retina separates from supporting cells, resulting in a mass of immature retinal cells to build up behind the pupil. This condition is known as leukocoria and can be seen visually as the cat's eye reflex, which I will show you now. So this is a child with leukocoria. Um, you can see that on the left side or the right, right eye. Um, has that really shiny pupil that you would see in a cat. So it's pretty accurate description there. Um, but yeah, so there's a leukocoria. Um, in addition to the abnormal vascularization, blindness also occurs as a result of retinal degeneration, which occurs in utero. Um, this degeneration results in either, or in blindness either at birth or during early infancy. Um, as these children enter early infancy and childhood, they continue to have progressive ocular issues such as cataracts, which we know is the eventual clouding of the cornea. Um, iris degeneration may also occur where the colored portions of the eyes and sometimes the entire eyeball shrink during the first months of life, um, which is probably the most devastating or destructive um, thing to see and shocking as well um, in these patients. Um, so moving into our area, so hearing loss, um, most individuals with neuron disease experience progressive hearing loss due to vascular abnormalities of the stria vascularis and the cochlea, um, which results in stria vascularis dysfunction and eventually sensory neural hearing loss. So stria vascularis dysfunction um, and the lack of blood flow to the cochlea results in a lack of endolymph production and poor ion transport to hair cells, and resulting in the hearing loss. Um, the hearing loss typically begins in early, early adolescence, but can start as early as five. Um, initially, the hearing loss is asymmetrical. It's mild and begins in the high frequencies. Um, but as these patients age, the hearing loss deteriorates and eventually um, become symmetrical in both ears by the age of 35 um, with variations in severity. And then the speech discrimination luckily is usually well preserved um, or it's been documented in, in these, these patients. Um, so epidemiology, uh, due to its rarity, the exact incidence of neuro disease is unknown. There are no known associations with specific races or ethnic groups. Um, and has been documented documented in the United States, Europe, and Asia, so it's worldwide. Um, the disease occurs almost exclusively in males, but there have there have been rare reports of the disease in females. Excuse me. So that's something to that's a pretty big. Oh, well, it's a big, but it's a broad red flag um, that it's only in males. Um, risk factors. Because it's a genetically inherited disorder, there are no known risk factors, unfortunately. Um, although, if for some reason the family or the parents decided to do genetic testing and they found this out, then that would be a risk factor. But other than that, there aren't any. Um, moving on to clinical and differential diagnosis. Uh, patients with the presentation of neuro disease present with three main features, um, and the red flags to be aware of to uh, to be aware of include the following, which is the infantile blindness, which is the primary thing affected. Um, so usually at birth. Number two is progressive hearing loss that begins in adolescence, um, and number three the cognitive and behavioral issues um, that persist through life is also something to think um, to be aware of. Um, additional red flags during case history include the known family history of nor disease, which again, I mean, I don't know if how often parents actually do testing and if that's how common of occurrence that is. Um, anyways, yeah, and being male. So 
Uh, diagnosis of neuron disease can only be accomplished with an interdisciplinary approach that involves the audiologist, primary care, um, ophthalmologist, optometrist, and medical geneticist. Again, um, the audiologist is involved in just testing the hearing, seeing how bad the hearing loss is and um, or secondary to the vision loss. Uh, the ophthalmologists and optometrists are the main one of the main people seeing these or main professionals um, seeing this population as uh, vision loss is uh, the primary area that's affected. Um, then the medical geneticist, um, again, is going to help with genetic testing and um, identifying if this patient does indeed, in fact, have neuro disease. Um, again, audiologic. Uh, audiological testing alone cannot determine if the patient has uh, neuro disease, but it's useful to, to determine the amount of hearing loss and if amplification is even necessary. So these are some. Uh, uh, these are basically the audiometry results that you'll likely see. Um, so otoscopy is going to be normal. Type A temps because it's a sensory neural loss. Uh, reflexes are generally going to be present just because um, it's usually a mild mild loss so you should be able to get reflexes. Um, pure tones again it's going to be asymmetrical mild high frequency hearing loss as a child but it's going to be symmetrical by 30 years old um, or third decade of life and will vary in severity. Um, SRT is going to be consistent with your pure tones. Word rec is going to be consistent with the hearing loss. Same with OAEs and the ABR, if you have to test that way, it's going to be variable. Um, well, not variable, but it's likely going to be the same mild when they're a child and then variable as uh, the severity progresses uh, throughout life. Uh, medical evaluation. Unfortunately, there's no cure for neuro disease. Um, genetic testing is recommended to assist in the diagnosis. Patients um, should also be referred to an ophthalmologist as surgical intervention. Intervention is helpful for those with the leukocoria, um, and it's also helpful to remove cataracts and treat detached retinas. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that the most or that most surgical treatments will not preserve their vision. Um, they're not preservation techniques. They're just mainly used to prevent the eyes from shrinking. Shrinking. Um, but Yes. So, uh, lastly, audiologic treatment, um, generally for those with neuro disease, is going to be accomplished through traditional amplification just because the hearing loss is generally not that bad. It's mild, um, although it does range, but traditionally, um, or generally, traditional amplification will suffice. Um, Cochlear implants may be warranted if the degree of, um, of loss is severe enough. There has been cases where um, CIs were used since the progression of hearing loss um, got bad enough. Um, in a 2012 study, four patients with neuro disease underwent implantation and reported significantly improved quality of life. So uh, it seemed to have helped. Um, bone conduction and middle ear devices are not warranted as the loss is exclusively sensory neural, so um, yeah, you don't need to go that way. And that is it. So hopefully um, everything came out pretty clear, and I hope that all the information is useful and helpful. Um, I know it's kind of a lot to unpack, um, and that the disorders are they have a lot going on so it's definitely a challenge um but yeah uh also sorry for not putting in a picture of usher uh for usher syndrome like i did before that ship has sailed but anyways guys thanks for watching and